Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 131. Typical stocks for an all-weather portfolio. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. Today we are live talking about our typical stocks that we would have in an all-weather portfolio. All that and more. See you on the inside. Hey, European DJ. How are you, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good. So it's so cool to meet you for the first time face to face. Actually, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was I was asking how you, how you've been, but we've been together all day, so I kind of knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit sleepy. I had to take the flight, early flight. I had to wake up at three thirty, but I'm still holding strong, and uh, it's always good in good company. So, yeah, and, and hey, we've got we've got some questions, um, a lot around how your trip has been so far. So maybe we might just start jumping into some yeah. questions like, like Alexandros has asked how's the weather how's the weather in Ireland well remarkably sunny today uh, there was a bit of strong wind in the beginning I believe um, but now it's been sunny not really rainy but you know that's the weather here right uh, I, I saw that they were making jokes on Facebook already uh, on the on the Dividend Talk Facebook group that the weather in Ireland is more predictable than the stock market and I guess that's right. But today it was sunny. So it was a green day uh, from that point of view. Maybe tomorrow we have a red day if it's uh, if it's raining. It, it's supposed to rain tomorrow, but that, I mean, it's not predictable at all. Let me let me tell you, it could rain, it could be windy, it could be anything. But I'm enjoying it. If you're going to bring the sunshine, you should come over more often because I actually enjoyed the weather today. It was, it was quite nice. Yeah, we went also for a walk downtown, right? We um, maybe good for the, the the listeners as well. We decide we were talking a little bit about the strategy of the dividend talk podcast. We will talk a bit, maybe uh, a little bit more about that. So yeah. effectively, we spent a few hours in the pub, nice sitting with our laptops, a bit talking, brainstorming. I really, really, really enjoyed that. So so far, the first day has been really, really fru- fruitful for us. I would say. Yeah, and look, a lot of people are asking about first impressions what's it like seeing each other personally EDJ is a bit taller than I thought but other than that I think we've been face to face for nearly three years now so yeah there yeah. wasn't too many surprises but you're also way taller than I thought and we were talking about it I think we have our uh, camera set up at home that uh, the cameras higher than our heads so we're always looking down on each other yeah. so my impression when I saw you like this guy is tall. What? This is so so weird. It's like what you have sometimes after COVID that you're meeting your colleagues again in the office. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's it's mad how from a PC or a computer you have a perception of how tall someone is when in reality you have you have no idea. Um, and maybe one one other question is what kind of beer are you drinking together? Well, none because I'm not really a beer drinker. So you you you, you order the Guinness, you let me taste, and honestly, it. It's not my kind of stuff, so I'm, I'm more like, uh, I like cocktails and everything, yeah. but the bar was not so serving cocktails. I wanted the whiskey sour, yeah. they didn't offer, so maybe uh, tomorrow if we go somewhere to a cocktail bar, I can try. But no, I'm not a beer consumer as such. Maybe Desperado uh, from yeah. Heineken, but you know, these are like juices with a flavor, yeah. right? And they call it beer, which is not beer. I think it's a, it's more beer for girls or for pussies, but I don't hope that uh, anyone's listening from the other gender. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you did bring some vodka over from Poland. I think it's called Zubrowka. 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 From so the bison. Uh, let's, so. let's have a little cheers on here. Cheers. cheers. <sighs> oh. <laughs> I think we're the only podcast where we are live taking vodka shots. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can't see it, it's audio only, so it's probably a bit strange for people. But I mean, you can't see our faces, but that's the second shot I've had. And it, it, it did not get easier to drink, I have you to want, say. You want a refill? Uh, we, we'll, we will have one during the show. We definitely will. We definitely will. 
So maybe there's also a question uh, from because Roger the block he asked like Slivovic or whiskey, of course vodka in this case, right? Yeah. But the whiskey sour would always do for me. And then Chago Diaz is actually asking like when will we have our first in real life dividend day? Because I know last summer we were trying to plan this. Uh, we were discussing this today and we should really do it somewhere in the summer. And I would really recommend that we do it somewhere near Frankfurt. It's one of the most central hubs in Europe. Uh, everyone can connect by plane to Frankfurt or by car. It's not too far. So I think we should really do something in the summer around Frankfurt, this area, and uh, spend a long weekend together and talk dividends and do all the fun stuff. Maybe present it, our portfolios to each other, each, each strategy to each other and just have fun and lots yeah. of in your case, is beers and, and, and... I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll pick a date over the next week mm -hmm. and we'll stick to it. And then whoever comes, comes. No oh, that would be a great idea. Because yeah. the last time we tried, we were putting yeah. in too many dates. I think we just pick a date um, in the middle of the summer, June, July, and then... Yes, and this will be an open invite to all listeners. So if you're really curious and you would like to meet up with some like-minded people, you know, consider it already an open invite. Uh, more to come. Yeah. So you mentioned you mentioned about our strategy. We did have some talks to this. So maybe we've been doing this podcast for for three years, and I think it's important for our listeners and even new listeners to understand what our vision what our vision is and yeah. our mission, and maybe some of our goals and values. Because I think that's always quite important. Mm -hmm. I know I got challenged on this on YouTube actually the other day about I posted a short, and they were like, "Why don't you Why don't you express your?" What, what you're gaining from this and honestly I wasn't gaining at and I didn't own the company I wasn't trying to do anything and my response was maybe listen to the podcast I've talked about this company but I'm completely honest with my portfolio so I just think it's quite yeah fitting just to, to give some of our what our vision is and maybe our mission and goals as well yeah so if look we have a boring vision statement I can even read it out loud it's empowering ordinary Europeans to achieve financial freedom through dividend growth investing and, you know, it, it sounds maybe boring, but this is really what our mission is, because we have both we have both been in this space that we didn't know even about dividend investment. We didn't even we were, I said, kind of numbed down by what governments tell us and what our family tells us, like, I, you know, put some just save money. It's it's yeah. it's, it's risk free. And then you have something for a rainy day. And, 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 you know, politicians still make us believe that we can count on our retirement without any loss of, 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 of let's say, um, wealth and, 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 and quality of life, right? But it's all an illusion. We, we know the simple facts are this year, you know, in, in the Netherlands also again, it was 10 to 15% inflation. I must see the fee first pension fund that will say we hike our, uh, we re-index it with 10, 15%. Mm -hmm. So it's just, in my opinion, it's kind of a, a big scam out in the open, but politicians won't really uh, say it out loud because they don't want to create yeah. uproar. So for me, I'm really, really, uh, um, really, really passionate around waking everyone up that deserves to be woken up, that is at least a bit curious and to really empower them uh, uh, to achieve financial freedom by themselves and live this quality of life that I think everyone deserves, right? Yeah. And empowering for me means like that people can make their own decisions, yeah? that they are knowledgeable enough and can make their own decisions about how to reach financial freedom. And, and we spoke about this more often. Financial, financial freedom is not the same as financial independence. Exactly, yeah. Financial freedom is that people themselves discover what that means for them and whether that's an additional 500 euro in passive income per month so that they have this as a top up to their retirement so that gives them this little extra safety net that that's already enough for me yeah. right when i think about that and, and part of me as well when, when i started my blog originally it was to prove you didn't have to be super rich or a high income earner or, or anything of the sort just with a little bit of discipline putting in a little bit every month I think it's possible to re achieve financial freedom. And I think showing my portfolio is kind of, I'm, I'm not a high earner, but by any means, I'm mm -hmm. probably medium, medium yeah. wage within, within Ireland. So if I can do it, anyone really can do it. I know there's obviously low, low income that might struggle a bit more, but I just think showing people it's possible, being consistent, having a plan and just sticking to it and showing the results yeah. and watching the snowball effect is empowering. And I think, our mission is just to spread this world to as, as many Europeans. We know we have a lot of international 
audience. But I think we are Europeans, we're passionate Europeans, and we just want to see we just want to see more Excellent. people jump on board. Exactly. And you know, then then there are and this is a vision, right, that we have, right? That everyone can can discover this and can do it by himself. So our mission is therefore also to really to inspire inspire really as many people as possible to seek this financial freedom. But also doing that by building and really maintaining a diversified dividend growth portfolio while we are also promoting really long-term and sustainable wealth creation, right? Again, it sounds a bit maybe even corporate, but for us, this is really what it is about. So a vision is like empowering people, but then our mission is really like showing this via our dividend growth portfolios and really that we all the time remind people like it's not about speculation about what the share price will do one day or uh, the next day we yeah. don't know yeah we, we really don't understand this even this stuff yeah but long term we know that high quality businesses that grow their earnings are most likely to grow their dividend income specifically if they are clear in their commitments on their investor relation pages and with that they should grow our passive income yeah so that's really our miss, m- mission to to enable that financial freedom really via dividend growth investing so that's that's what we do i mean our values i think anyone that listens i hope would already know but i we like to be as honest as we can as we can we give as much information about our portfolios about our mistakes about everything we do we pretty much broadcast a lot of what we do we try and educate as much as possible we're no experts we don't give financial advice but we help as much as we can we share our experiences and lastly we try to inspire with our own unique european flavor so that's what dividend talk is about and yeah maybe it's also good to mention just that we don't have a profit anything or something like that so all these podcasts that we have done 130 we didn't earn any dime yeah it is no ads uh, anything so maybe we will do in the in the in the future if it's needed but it would only to be to cover our costs or our time Yeah. yeah So it's really just passion and um, yeah, and, and, and this visit just also shows that there's definitely a few years more to come on this one. So it just helps us a little bit like to kind of get the strategies that we have also focus. Yes, yeah, so yeah. that we don't lose the focus of why are we together uh, as such as well. And yeah, it was really good for you to, 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 to brainstorm with you today yeah. and to, to really sharpen this a little bit for ourselves. So that also when we do our content planning for the year and such that we can really make sure that we deliver on this because that's the most important. Okay, that's enough boring corporate stuff for for now. We might move on to some news of the week. And I had one piece that I found really interesting. I know Tesla, we talk about Tesla in the news all the time. And if you think of autonomous cars, you think of Tesla. But I I don't know how I came across this. I think actually my brother sent it on to me. But Mercedes are actually the first automaker to be offered a license for level three self-driving in the US. I was blown away from, by this. And, and, and do you know what level three driving means on, 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 on the, in the terms of artificial intelligence? Yeah, so it means that it's vague. It gives a vague explanation, mm-hmm. but it says it can take over certain driving tasks, but the driver is still required to be present and ready to take control. But I think it can do it more in high density areas yeah. I, i think level two you can have it but not in high density mm. areas whereas this you can go onto a motorway yeah. um, and and and, and that's also really interesting right because if you think about tel- tesla as a really huge first movers advantage yeah yeah and and i feel quite confident that tesla will be still like the industry leader for several years even just because of their battery factories yeah. right which are state of the art but to see that You know, when I think about the German car makers, I always felt like, ah, oh, they're behind the curve, they're years behind. But to be able to, to on AI, yeah. to be already a, the first one in a level three, that's, that says something. It probably doesn't say everything, but it just shows something that there is some uh, catch up going on in this industry. Yeah. And, you know, I'm still waiting for an affordable Tesla that uh, <laughs> Elon Musk promised, yeah. even with the 20% discount that he's giving now. It is not, uh, it's not really helping me. It's still way too expensive. Yeah, I, I think it's only in Nevada they have this uh, license. They've applied for it in California, which they said they're expecting to get within two weeks. But the funny thing was is that this was, they, they gave an announcement and this was like an afterthought on the announcement. The actual announcement that they made was about their plan to build a one billion global network of 
electric fast chargers. That was that was the main news, and then they just kind of thrown in at the end saying, "Well, hey, look, we're the first company to have uh, level three yeah. self driving." So look, I I watched Dirty Money, and I have like sour grapes when it comes to German car makers. But I mean, this this mm. is I think this is quite big. I think it's actually yeah. quite quite big, and the fast chargers is a clever move as well. Nice, nice, nice. So that was maybe news of the week, but what I'm actually really curious about, Derek, did you buy anything this week? Yes, I did. So you know the way I was in, I was involved in crypto before. I actually had had money left over in one of these. It was called Fetch. It's actually crypto for AI is what it was called. And I don't know for for some reason I I haven't checked that account in a year. I logged in, I noticed that this account had jumped up to over what I had deposited. I was like. Mm-hmm. Shit, I forgot I had this money. Took it out and put it straight into my interactive brokers account and bought some NN Group. And I have to say it was inspired... So thicker th- symbol NN from the Netherlands. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I have to say it was inspired by your podcast, or not your, your blog. I went through uh, insurance companies. I was looking at Alliance and I came across NN Group and said, I want to put the money into that. They're on my radar now, so I have to do a deeper dive. But that's... That's, what uh, that's a really good pick because NN Group is a spin-off of um, ING, I believe, yeah. from the past. Yeah. And uh, they became an insurance company. And I will never forget this Polly's dividend. He is like a Dutch blogger. He stopped, he quit blogging. But I will never forget that he was buying at the depth of COVID. He was buying like NN Group for 22 euros or something Ooh. like that. And I was kind of... Mocking him in the sense of like, <laughs> are you sure, you know, this and this and that? And are they committed to the dividend? And he has now like a 12 or 13 percent yield on cost. And he was just going, you know, into this. And I, I, I kind of regret it. But like you, I think it dropped to 38 euro yeah, or something like yeah. that. So it is quite an attractive price if you look at uh, yeah. NN Group now. Yeah. 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 It was, it was, nice buy. I, I think that's what swayed me in terms of them or, or Alliance. It was... I think yeah. I found them a little bit more attractive. So and they have like a six and a half percent yield, six yeah, percent yield, six percent. Now I have a high yielding portfolio as we discussed last week. So, <laughs> so you need to keep <laughs> so it up. I need to, I need to keep it up. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Good pick. I, I didn't buy anything yet, by the way. I'm still dry. Um, you know, I goes before the thirty first of January. Yeah. I will have bought something, but yeah. there I'm still looking whether it should be a more T row price whether it should be some more Texas Instruments or maybe an insurer because insurers, not not Munich RE, for me, that's way too expensive at the moment, but yeah. NN Group or going more into ASR because I put my bet more on ASR in the last uh, yeah. month. So maybe I'll buy a bit more of that, but maybe I should just have both because both NN Group and ASR are really nice dividend plays uh, yeah. in the Netherlands and 15% dividend tax. Yeah, nice. Nice one. I look forward to hearing your pick, what you buy before before the end of the month. So this week we're talking about an all-weather portfolio, inspired, of course, by the questions we got from the Irish weather that's unpredictable. So we said, why not pick a portfolio based on an all-weather portfolio? Yeah, so, you know, when I think about all-weather, right, it means it can rain, the sun can shine, it can storm, and the house should be safe. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can take the first one and it's a funny one. It's called, the company is called Service Corporation International. The ticker symbol from Google is NYSE from New York Stock Exchange and then SCI. And this is a funny business because this is a company that is fully into the death care. Yeah, so they provide products and services in the United States and Canada and it really operates through funeral and cemetery segments. So effectively, they provide funeral services. You can buy the casket there, even up to the flowers. Yeah. Yeah. For me, if there's one all weather business, is this one because people will continue to die. Yes. And COVID has been an extreme tailwind for them. It was a gift that kept on giving for them. Yeah, so this company is, is really well positioned. So they have like a 10 year consecutive dividend growth. Uh, they had to cut it uh, early on in the, in, in, I think around 2005 or something like that, they had to cut it. 
but that was also that was then now is now they have at the moment they have a 25 percent free cash flow uh, payout ratio it was always around 50 percent but again due to covid and such many people died so their business was really going up in the air and uh, they currently yield only 1.6 percent so that's of course too little for me but at a 25 percent payout ratio hmm not too bad right yeah. there's a lot of room for growth. It's currently trading at a PE multiple of 17. Their five-year annual average EPS growth was 20% and their five-year annual dividend growth rate was 11%. For me, this just shows that it's a really strong performing company. And honestly, if you're in the business of people dying and with the boomers now being at this age that they are going to massively die everywhere, I've got Omega Healthcare, which is like the last mile for dead people, yeah. right? It's like you spend there a week and you're dead. So I've got that one with a high yield there. And now, you know, Service Corporation International. So, I mean, if you believe that the boomers are all going to die in the next decade, I would really look at this because still people want to bury people under the ground or cremate there. We're still not throwing them in the rivers. Yeah. So for me... The, 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 and the 17 PE, if you're not too, not too picky on the yield, honestly, just thinking common sense, right? Yeah. 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 We, now, there's yeah. one little red flag is their debt. Their debt is relatively high compared to its equity. They've been buying back shares a lot. But, you know, so debt to equity of one point something. So that is higher than I like to see it. But on the other side, it's a stable business, uh, predictable business kind of. So... You know, but I think it's good also to say the risks to this company. But generally, I think if you think about the all weather, people will continue to die whether the sun shines or whether it rains. Yeah, yeah, and no, I think that's a fair pick. I, I can't actually believe there's a, fu a funeral home as a public traded company. You, you would imagine, I just know from Ireland, there's lots of them dotted around, but it's a no-brainer. We've got a, a, an aging population. I think that's no secret. So it's a, it's a, it's a good pick. It's a good pick. Um, I went the other end of the spectrum so I went with WD40 as my first pick oh you need that for a rusty casket exactly exactly I mean who doesn't use this product and particularly if it comes into recessions and people like to do stuff at home themselves you don't want to pay the handyman down the road what have you got in your product in your cupboard WD40 you just give everything a spray it gets rid of rust it gets, it gets, rid, of, <laughs> gets rid of everything um, but look I think, I think they sell a couple of products, but this is an example of, I don't get it because you can easily replicate this product, but you can't replicate the brand. If, if you're going to- it's, it's a household it, name. Exactly. I mean, you would call it WD-40. Even if you bought a replica, you would still probably call it WD-40. So I think the mode is incredible. They got this product, they're in that market and there's nobody going to penetrate yeah. that. On top of that, their dividend history looks pretty pretty good i mean that that chart is is amazing their 10 year annual growth rate is 10.39 percent that's pretty pretty impressive for for something that just degreases and clears roast because this well, how do you call this in english these are lubricants lubricants right? yeah, yeah yeah so i think i think it's a fantastic company a great moat i mean their financials look pretty good i'm concerned about the free cash flow this year 2022 mm -hmm. i'm looking at it it's negative i don't i don't know why i haven't looked into it but in terms of the business, it looks really, really solid. The yield again is the only thing that would concern me. They have a, a low yield and it's 32 PE ratio is probably a little bit much to buy. Yeah. But if you're not thinking about that, if you're thinking about putting something in your portfolio for 30 years, then you don't care about PE yeah. ratios. And it's funny that you say that because this year I bought, uh, I had to buy new oil for the, uh, for the bike chains. Yeah. What did I buy? WD-40. Why? Because it's a brand that I recognize. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I would buy any other brand for, for this. Yeah. It's amazing, right? Yeah. If, if you're able to establish this as a business, it means you're a household product. And yeah, yeah this all-weather stock, I, I definitely agree. Yeah. yeah. No, no, really, really nice pick. Really nice pick. So my next pick... Um, would actually be, and I know I spoke a lot about this one in the podcast, but it would be Koninklijke Ahold because whether it's COVID that we've seen, whether it's a recession, whether it's just normal times, people tend to go 
always to the supermarket. We need our toilet paper. We need our cheese. We need our uh, all whatever it is. They have 60% of their business in America. I believe they have a 5% market share, more than Target uh, with the Food Lion. For me, if you also think about the all weather portfolio here, I think a, a supermarket chain should should be in there. Yeah. Now, then you can cho choose between Walmart and, and then, for instance, Ahold. But as being a European patriot, I would always go for Ahold. Uh, I love the brand of Albert Heijn. That's one, of course, I know a lot. It's a little bit like... Uh, more premium than Aldi and Lidl um, and they are always innovating with technology I remember like in, in back in 2005 or 2006 they had the app called Appy yeah. and you could already walk through the whole shop in a certain order prepare your shopping list and it would it would sort it for you in the right order today I can still not do that in the supermarkets where I'm shopping I'm now talking about 12 years ago and it was such a cool concept because it was it's really convenient. The worst is where you lose time is if you want if you go via your wife's created shopping list because it's never in order. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it comes in their brains in a, in a total unlogical way. So then you get like, oh honey, I need the bread. Oh honey, I need fish. Oh honey, I need vegetables. And guess what? You go for the bread. It's the opposite. Sorry. You need to go for the fish to the other side, and you need to come back for the vegetables. <laughs> Appy all fixed this. It was the perfect app for men that get a shopping list from their wives yeah. yeah so this is for me in my mind this is Ahold this is how I remember Ahold and Albert Heijn and then you have also uh, the Bol.com asset and below I think they have a bit of a mistake that they try to IPO it too late yeah that's a pity yeah. um, but on the other end they can stick with it there's no harm keeping exactly. it and they do 1 billion in share buybacks a year already for many years, which is approximately 2.5% to 3% of their shares outstanding. So it's also really a slow compounder. You get a shareholder yield. If you take that plus 3.5% dividend or 3% dividend, you're talking here about a 6 and 6.5% 6 shareholder yield, pure from uh, dividends and um, buybacks. Yeah, it's, it's a go pick and it's European. It's like... If I was in America, I'd probably pick someone like Procter & Gamble or something because their products are definitely in their shelves. But as a European, yeah. we have to go with someone like Gawold. So, no, go pick. I was looking, I was going to go consumer staples and think, because if I look around the household, I have Unilever products everywhere. But I'm a, I spoke to you earlier about this. I'm a little bit unsure of, of Unilever. You know they're in transition and there's, there's a whole lot going on. So I went more pharmaceutical. Again, I was juggling, was, would I pick Johnson & Johnson? But they're transitioning, we know they're going more biotech, so who's the next best? Roche Holdings. I know we spoke about these before. I write, I write on Shore Dividend about these. They are a quality company. They're a Swiss company, which probably is the one thing that prevents me from investing in them. I would love to hold them. But they're in some cancer drugs. Cancer is unfortunately not going to go away completely. Mm -hmm. These guys are at the pinnacle of, of that. They have been for, for years. Also, on top of things like diabetes, again, I don't ever see them going away. So I think Roche, as a, as a company, they're family-owned. We mentioned this before. We had a conversation. You know, who, who says this? Family-owned businesses, only investors. But I think, they're, look, I think they're a quality company. Love what they do. Cancer, diabetes are two things I would love to eliminate completely. Um, and that's, that's, that's my second pick. Yeah, that's... I think sometimes people say like it's really hard to mm. value a pharma company and it's true. Yeah? yeah, like if you go into the niche area of, of biotech, deep biotech, you need to understand the science. But if you think about companies like Roche, Novartis, Sanofi, uh, Epfi, these are mature companies with a good pipeline and you get ample opportunity to see declining uh, pipelines, like with Gilead, yes. yeah, with uh, after HIV, uh, yeah. I believe it was, or hepatitis, one of those two, like like still like after several years, you can they're still there, yeah, because there's just so much um, cash flow still there that those companies have time to find their mo way, and we as invent investors have time to make up our mind and. Yeah. Uh, it's not like a one-hit wonder or something like that. So yeah. from that point of view, I think a, a, a good blue-chip pharma must be in every 
Now, okay, should be in every yeah. dividend growth portfolio because also they are anti-cyclical. They don't care whether it's a recession or not. Yeah, I mean, cancer is going to happen whether recession is yeah. here or not. Similar to a funeral home, diabetes is going to happen. So you're constantly going to need drugs for these. You're constantly going to need care for these. Um, so that's why I would pick a company, company yeah. like this. So what you can see, right, in an all-weather portfolio, we also need all those kind of different ingredients, right? Because one time it's uh, raining, other time it's sun, wind, so this is similar. So my next pick, yeah, guys, it has to be Microsoft. I mean, there, if you look at also what I really love about Microsoft is the diversification of their product portfolio. It's not just Windows anymore as we knew it from 10 years ago, right? For instance, 34% comes from server products and cloud services, which includes Azure, right? 22% uh, comes from office products. 12% comes from Windows. And then we have 8% from gaming. And then we can still go on LinkedIn, for instance. LinkedIn is, I believe, 7% of their revenue. LinkedIn, they bought it, what was it, for 16 billion? Yeah, yeah. It's now 16% of their revenue. and And... We are talking about Facebook and, and all these kinds of social media networks, uh, right? But the real, real social media uh, in our unicorn that has really delivered on its revenue and, and cash flow potential has been LinkedIn. And only after it came into Microsoft. So it also shows that Microsoft is kind of a holding company that can really grow businesses. Yeah. So I really hope that they also will be able to invest this 10 billion in open AI because I see, again, a flywheel effect here with it requires more Azure services and all these kinds of things, right? So such an Adela is my hero of the decade, definitely. And, you know, this also the dividend growth, it's amazing, right? It's around 10%, I believe, on the five-year annual growth. Of course, the yield is, is relatively um, low at the moment, but... No, that's what you get uh, with this this one. I, I I have the luck to have a really high yield on cost already. Yeah. But I don't see this company stopping in the next 10 years. The flywheel is so much spinning at the moment that it's hard to stop it. And even a recession, I think you mentioned to me today, you're not going to cut your office licenses in a recession. What are you going to do? Bring your whole production to a halt? Yeah. Are you going to really kill all your cloud services? Maybe you start to negotiate more so that it comes price pressure. But what, what will you do if, my, if Microsoft says, okay, you know, take it or leave it. Otherwise, we pull our contract and you need to migrate everything to IBM. Now, is that, is that an alternative? It's not going to happen. I mean, this tech is everywhere, isn't it? It's, it's, exactly. It's in your home. It's in your business. It's, it's everywhere. So it, it's not going away. And you mentioned LinkedIn, and I think it's, it's quite remarkable what they've done. It's, it's a social media platform. And you look at something like Twitter, which is arguably more popular. I don't know the exact numbers on both platforms, yeah. but we know Twitter is struggling to make money. Yeah, and, and was bought for forty-two billion. But 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 even before that, yeah. it was struggling to make money. They've tried and and they failed. And then you look at the the numbers that LinkedIn is bringing in, and I don't even uh, when I'm on it, I don't recognize any ads or anything like that. So yeah. it's really clever what they it's, it's really good what they've done with that, and it just shows that good management can make money out of these companies with a little bit of know-how yeah. and, and, and the right people in charge. So I think I would have had Microsoft in there personally myself. So I think that's yeah. it. And, and maybe what I would like to do, I would like to pick the question from Alexander already, right? He was on our podcast. Uh, sorry, Maarten. Yeah. Um, and Maarten from uh, Twitter, he asked me today, um, let me check here it is. EDGI commented he wants more quality stocks. Did you ever consider whether your process of 10-year discounted cash flow with conservative exit multiples is one of the reasons you frequently find quality overvalued? Quality compounds safely for longer, and this shines in longer-term analysis. And he's right here, I think. Yes. Right? I am on the conservative side. But for instance, for me, Microsoft is at the moment fairly valued. Yeah. I don't need more Microsoft, but it's already a large position in my portfolio. Also, the yield is not compensating me enough to drive it. If I wouldn't have any Microsoft today, I would probably consider it. And, you know, in the end, I'm, I'm, I'm still a dividend growth investor. Yeah. And if I look, for instance, my base case scenario is that over the next five years, I can see Microsoft still growing 15% of their cash flow annually and afterwards 12%. 
if I then take a really conservative discount rate of 12.5%, it's more than my normal 10%, and a multiple of 18, it's fairly valued right now. So Marta, while you're right, right, if we think about L'Oreal, uh, Louis Vuitton, all these kinds of companies, um, you're, you're right there. I am more on the conservative side. I have really long patience. But for me, Microsoft today is an example. And there are more tech stocks, probably like Amazon. I didn't analyze Amazon, but Google, for instance, for me, Google and Microsoft are now fairly valued compared to my expectations of future, future returns. So um, what I more see is that it is more like industries come and go in, in, in waves. So last year, clearly insurance companies were undervalued. Yeah. And we were talking about it at the time that if rates increase, they should do better. And they have been doing better. Exactly, yeah. Now, technology stocks get hammered because of the increase in interest rate, because we put more pressure on the valuation. Therefore, we want to see profits. So for me now, tech has come down significantly enough that I see it hitting my fair value ranges. So, yeah, Marta, you are spot on. Uh, I just struggle with that also in combination with the yield, because if I need to buy a stock for a 1% yield and it grows, let's say, 10% annually over the next decade at least, then we know with the rule of 72 that in seven years, the yield will double. So I go from 1% to 2%. This is just too little if I want to meet my retirement goals. Yeah. So it's not only the, the valuation that I take into consideration, it's also the starting yield. Because for me, it makes not really a lot of sense to, to wait, let's say, 7 to 10 years or 10 years to get to a 2.5% yield. It's not contributing to my goals. But you kind of look at a company like Microsoft more as a growth company I, I yes I more than a more than dividend growth the, the dividend yield is small and and the dividend is a little bonus but i think you look at them as, as a growth company and if you look at at them nothing has changed fundamentally it's just the whole tech market is down and they've, yeah. they've suffered because of that but their share price was sitting at 343 dollars at its peak yeah. in 2021 i don't see any reason why it doesn't doesn't get back get there. back there yeah. exactly me too i'm really bullish on this company nice one so we, we've covered we've, we've covered debt we've covered household goods we've covered consumer staples pharma pharma everyone still wants to have a good time and in the, in the meanwhile we need to drink on that <laughs> yeah. so i will pour another vodka because we're still uh, talking too much we're not jolly enough so but in, in my mind everyone needs to have a good time and if, if you're in ireland you're look, you're in you're in a pub today it was what one o'clock it was yeah. packed packed to the rafters we, True. we could True. barely get a seat everyone likes to have a good time so i picked diageo because everyone and i put in brackets almost because you wouldn't drink it everyone almost drinks guinness um, but genuinely i would have someone like diageo in there i know when there's recession in some places there's not a recession all over the world and they've got some really big brands guinness smirnoff baileys johnny walkers captain morgan they are drank all over the world Maybe not even Diageo, but there's plenty of other brands out there. But I would have, I would have a company like this. Their dividend yield is is quite low. I still think that I still think they're overvalued. But look at their annualized growth. There's six percent over the last ten years, which I think is pretty good. At the moment, you get them for two percent yield, but if you take buybacks into consideration, it's about three point eight three. I get this info from from Kaifin, so that's mm -hmm. um, that's what I have. But Personally, I would have have to have a company like like the Azure in my portfolio. Yeah, because what do you do when there's a recession and you lose your job? You start drinking. Yes, it's the only thing that gives you pleasure at that moment in time, yeah. right? So, well, okay, I shouldn't maybe say it too loud because I don't want to stimulate alcoholism, of course. So that's uh, maybe good to know. But generally saying, um, this is also again anti-cyclical business. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I do believe that, for instance, what we saw with COVID, a bit the impact of China lockdowns. But how often do we have this lockdowns? Yeah, it was the first time in hundred years. Yeah. yeah, and and even though people couldn't go to the pub, I know in Ireland they probably drank more. They probably went out and bought more more drink. I have in my cupboard there. I'll show you. I have a Guinness tap, <laughs> just just to get these cans to make it feel like you're in a pub. Yeah, um, and these were selling. So I mean, I think people are going to try and enjoy the best of every situation and I think a company like the Azure is, is definitely worth having. What is funny about our picks, it's almost a life journey. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> we need Ahold for the food, 
We need WD-40 for our household uh, tasks that we get assigned. We need uh, Microsoft at work. We need Jag Diageo for in the weekends. And then we need, um, I said... Rush uh, to pick up the pieces. <laughs> yeah, rush to pick up the pieces. And then we have Service Corporation International. To, when, to, when we're finished. Yeah, when we're finished. <laughs> yeah. now, isn't that an all-weather portfolio? I believe so, right? Yeah, I, I think so. But I would be curious to hear from from our listeners what they would pick in their all weather portfolio i just wonder oh, how, how different yeah. it would be from from our so drop them on twitter on facebook and we might try to get some yes. sort of conversation going and, and maybe some decent picks that we can analyze over over the year yeah uh, so if you're interested the facebook group will put the link in the description of this podcast so check there and we're really nearing thousand uh, members right in the community yeah. we're now around 950 so just 50 left and we have a really unique milestone of 1,000 uh, community members. Amazing. That, that was our goal for the end of last year. We're a little bit over, but if we make it before the end of January, I will still call that a success. Yes, definitely, definitely. Awesome. So we have a portfolio review um, and I think you might, you might go through it a little bit there. Yeah, so we got from Simon, uh, I got a really nice email. He's living in uh, Cape Town, uh, South Africa. And effectively, he submitted his portfolio uh, review. And what he's saying is like, you know, he's, in, he's based in Cape Town and most of us are in Europe, right? Yeah. He's, he's half Spanish and he would like to retire in Spain. Um, he uses interactive brokers. He can do that in say, uh, South Africa, just like us, but with the benefit of that he has access to US ETFs and stocks because he's not in Europe. Congratulations, Simon. Best choice that you could make is <laughs> yeah. live in South Africa to get access to the, uh, the right ETFs, as an example. So um, he, he says like, look, I'm really busy at work, so I don't have a lot of time to uh, um, you know, research stocks. So he primarily uh, in, invests in ETFs. And I think many people are in this situation, right? We, we, we are just these weirdos that have this passion to <laughs> yeah. read annual reports, yeah. but who can really say that? Yeah. So, um, look, he is, he is really fully conscious of the estate duty tax from the U.S. We don't talk enough about it, but actually, um, I, I read somewhere last time that the U.S. is actually making, stri- making a more, bit more strict. Yeah. That you need to pay a lot of tax when, when you would die and the IRS would, would probably come after you, right? That's, that's kind of the narrative at the moment. Um, so, you know, generally saying, uh, based on this, he wants to limit it, I guess, a little bit. But his current portfolio is at the moment, and I would like to have your opinion on this, yeah. is he's having the Schwab Dividend ETF, yeah. SCHD. He wants to keep it below 60K yeah. to not get into issues with the t- uh, US tax. tax. Yeah, exactly. Then he is having the FUSD ticker. It's also a dividend growth um, uh, ETF. He has the UDVD ticker, also a dividend growth ETF. And he has some very small positions in ticker symbol DIVO, ticker symbol GEPI, JEPI, and then of course Realty Income and the Vanguard uh, dividend growth ETF, VIG. And yeah effectively of course he wants to retire and everything so the question is like what is your reflection on his portfolio i mean i think sometimes people get caught up in they listen to a podcast like us and we're picking stocks and they think maybe that's the the thing to do but you have to make invest in work for your situation i think that's exactly what you're doing and if more people did that we would probably be a little bit better off i don't think personally you have to pick individual stocks all the time we've said this before etfs will actually suit a lot more people so kudos to to him i'm assuming that he's spread it out between different etfs not to hit over sixty thousand per per shares i'm wondering is is that estate tax 60 percent total i mean do, do you have to spread it between between all three can you just put it all into schd or i don't know I think FUSD is more of a high income one, is it? I, I think, um, but I, look, I think I think the strategy works. I think it's it's good. I would probably do it myself if I if we could. If we we're all living in South Africa, we might probably invest in in ETFs yeah. over, over shares. He does have. I don't know some of these 
tickers D I V O. I don't know what that is, but I know ticker J E P I is that cover call. Yeah, I would get rid of it. ETF. Um, look, lots of people rant and rave about it. I, I don't know enough about it. He does have realty income, which is which is a read. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and actually. VIG from Vanguard is the godfather of all dividend Ex- growth ETFs. Exactly. I think uh, Schwab is being used. It's really, really in a hype at the moment because it yeah. has kind of a 3% yield and dividend growth, right? Yes. And the VIG has like really low starting yield. So that's why SCHD is so popular. But you need to also know then you own Exxon Mobile and all these kind of companies. So there's a reason why the yield is higher. But I would really get rid of GP, GEPI because a covered call ETF you get current uh, income, yeah? Yeah. But the issue is like, you will lose, in my opinion, most of the time capital when the, and specifically when the market goes down. Also, the, the dividend will be cut automatically because it isn't a dividend. It's passive income. It's income you get from uh, covered call selling. Yeah. And it's really hard to recover from those situations. Like in a, in a, in a 10 year bull market, it all looks great. Yeah, but in a down market, <laughs> I, I really don't feel comfortable with uh, this one and QYLD is the other one, yeah. right? So personally, I understand the high yield 10%. I wouldn't have it and I, I wouldn't have it because it's like, um, it's a double dip downwards. Yeah. Uh, you get double screwed. Th- th- there's probably a time to buy it. At the bottom of the market, uh, yeah. but then I buy John- Johnson & Johnson. Exactly, so yeah. I mean, th- we always say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. They have a high yield and that's what all the hype is about. So did AT&T, they cut the dividend, they cut it yeah. again. So there's no such thing as a free launch. So maybe I would agree. I don't understand enough about that particular ETF. Maybe maybe you understand it more. But but I think, look, I think our strategy is good. I also like that he's investing more aggressively in ticker FUSD and UDVD and then reinvesting those dividends into, yeah. into the Schwab one because you can buy them a fraction of yeah. share. So I think... I mean, I think you're not giving yourself enough credit. It might look boring, but it works. And I think I think this is... It, his path to wealth is already there. Yeah. It's now a question of discipline, consistency, exactly. not getting distracted. Yeah. I would probably even recommend to not listen to the Dividend Talk podcast any further. <laughs> no, because you will get all kinds of stock, num- stock tickers passing by and, and it might just distract you. Yeah. Yeah, so unless you have, uh, Simon, you have the 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 how you say willpower. It? the willpower to ignore all of us, then continue listening. But otherwise, yeah. stop listening to us, turn all this noise off and get another hobby and just, you know, invest in these ETFs and, and, and monthly aut- automate everything and don't listen anymore to stock market commentary. I'm jealous, though. I am jealous you can invest in these the instruments. Uh, my wife... We've set up a portfolio for her where she's just investing in ETFs, but European style. And I only wish she could have yeah, exactly, any exactly. of these three takers. So I mean, yeah. yes. So we're jealous. That's that's. I think that's <laughs> what you can take away from this. We're jealous you can invest in in these types of companies. Good. Thank you, Simon, so much. And it was really nice that you sent one time a portfolio with only ETFs. Yeah. So that was quite unique for us, and also really nice to see. So also to other listeners, don't be shy with your portfolios. Don't think for us what we will think about it. Yeah, we really love doing this. And honestly, sometimes I feel like we learn more yeah, from the port- from your portfolios than you learn from our commentary. So please keep them coming, even if I'm selfish. <laughs> yes. So we might move on to some listeners' questions. We have a few to get through. Um, yeah. The first one is from Carlo. And he's asking, do you think VFC is a value trap? Yeah, I think so, honestly. Uh, I did a whole Twitter thread one on, one time on it and also on Facebook. Um, I think they have too much brand risk at the moment. Um, like like Alexander already said, like on the Facebook group, he commented already to this question. He said, like, I think it's because the only thing that has consistently grown in the last decade, decade is their debt. Yeah. Also the dividends, actually, yeah, yeah, to be but fair. definitely also their debt. And I, 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 for me, it's a value trap. I find the dividend not safe. We were talking today, actually, like I had a trigger outstanding on, on, on shares and I bought few shares in VF Corp, not because I wanted to, but you know how it happens, right? They end up on my watch list. I, I put like a purchase order 
and then uh, I do my analysis. But in the meantime, it got triggered. So I bought few at $25 or something like that, or $26. So now they are $30. So I will quickly get rid of them on Monday when the market opened because I was not even realizing they got entered into my portfolio uh, <laughs> in the last week of uh, Christmas. So I will get rid of them ad- again because I don't want them in my portfolio. Yeah. I put them on the watch list. I studied them and I felt like, no way I want to have this because the dividend is not safe. Yeah. I mean, they do they do have a certain amount of, of brand power, and you saw that today, particularly yeah. in Ireland. There was a lot of people, including myself, I was wearing North Face, but a lot of people yeah. were wearing, I think, Irish-born investor mentioned that yeah. recently, particularly in Ireland, you see Vans and, and that, but we know those brands are not selling as well as, as they should. Yeah. If you go into a recession, that's, that's even worse. But if I was to run this company through my screen or at the moment, look at this, the revenue is, is choppy and, and went actually sideways since 10 years ago. I mean, that's... That's, that's not good at, in the beginning. The free cash flow has been declining. Their debt has been increasing. Yeah. That's not a good mixture for, for sustainable dividend. No, rate. it's not also a value trap. It's also a yield trap yeah. at the moment. Yeah, because many people are attracted by the yield. And what, what is also the case here, like a good brand doesn't make it a good business and a good business doesn't make it a good stock. Like yeah. also the way around, a good stock isn't necessarily always a good business. Yeah. yeah? I mean, they do have a good history, and they've they've navigated for well, fifty years. They've navigated recessions. They've they've had yeah. have had periods like this before. It is we said this. It is more of a family run business. We know that. So we we do know that their core beliefs are there, and that they are committed to the dividend. But I I genuinely think looking looking at what I'm looking at here, a dividend cut would actually be beneficial. Yeah, I think so as well. Why, clean why clean up the debt. Yes. Go, get be, for me, such companies should be actually debt free. Yes. Because then you can weather recessions, you can leverage up a little bit. Somehow the oil companies do this, right? Yeah. They know they know that they need the balance sheet uh, in, in, the, yeah. in the bad times. And VF Corp has not been doing that. And, and they could probably, and, and to be fair, one thing they are good at is spinning off businesses that mm. are underperforming and, and going yeah. after the growth. And they've shown a history in that. They probably need to do that again. It's probably not the right market conditions to do that, which is probably what's hampering them. But I would expect a dividend cut. I would also, I would keep monitoring them and if they start spinning off companies or reducing that debt load and focusing really on the high growth areas, then I think there might be an opportunity. Yeah. But I think you, I think similar to what I said to Coca-Cola uh, three years ago, you could wait two years. I think yeah. you could definitely wait two years here. There will be, no, I, I can't see them drop maybe around a $20, $20 mark. But I think at that moment, you'll have a better understanding of how to yeah. progress. So I personally think it's a value trap. I think their cash flow is, is awful. I think their balance sheet is awful. Um, but there's definitely a history of improvement. So I would add them to my watch list maybe in two years' time. Yeah, that's nice one. Um, I think after your conversation, we need another uh, vodka shot. Yes, we do. Because um, it's time. Cheers. Cheers. I don't know. I really think this is the the, the, the first podcast about dividends <laughs> where we might be drunk by, <laughs> by the end of the show. I mean, doing live show <laughs> trap yeah. at the moment, yeah, because many people are attracted by the yield. And what what is also the case here? Like a good brand doesn't make it a good business, and a good business doesn't make it a good stock. Like yeah. also the way around, a good stock isn't necessarily always a good business, yeah. yeah? I mean, they do have a good history, and they've they've navigated for well, fifty years. They've navigated recessions. They've they've had yeah. have had periods like this before. It is we said this. It is more of a family run business. We know that. So we we do know that their core beliefs are there, and that they are committed to the dividend. But I I genuinely think looking looking at what I'm looking at here, a dividend cut would actually be beneficial. Yeah, I think so as well. Why, clean why clean up the debt. Yes. Go, get be, for me, such companies should be actually debt free. Yes. Because then you can weather recessions, you can leverage up a little bit. Somehow the oil companies do this, right? Yeah. They know they know that they need the balance sheet uh, in, in, the, yeah. in the bad times. And VF Corp has not been doing that. And, and they could probably, and, and to be fair, one thing they are good at is spinning off businesses that mm. are underperforming and, and going yeah. after the growth. And they've shown a history in that. They probably need to do that again. It's probably not the right market conditions to do that, which is probably what's hampering them. But 
I would expect a dividend cut. I would also, I would keep monitoring them and if they start spinning off companies or reducing that debt load and focusing really on the high growth areas, then I think there might be an opportunity. Yeah. But I think you, I think similar to what I said to Coca-Cola uh, three years ago, you could wait two years. I think yeah. you could definitely wait two years here. There will be, no, I, I can't see them drop maybe around a $20, $20 mark. But I think at that moment, you'll have a better understanding of how to yeah. progress. So I personally think it's a value trap. I think their cash flow is, is awful. I think their balance sheet is awful. Um, but there's definitely a history of improvement. So I would add them to my watch list maybe in two years' time. Yeah, that's wrong. Um, I think after your conversation, we need another uh, vodka shot. Yes, we do. Because um, it's time. Cheers. Cheers. I don't know. I really think this is the, the, the first podcast about dividends <laughs> where we might be drunk by, <laughs> by the end of the show. I mean, doing live shows, doing, doing shows together is dangerous if we we're going to drink this much all the time. Yeah, so. yeah. So, but we still have some, some space to go with the bottle. But I think if we would drink the bottle together, I think we would have an issue with producing the, <laughs> editing the podcast tomorrow morning. Um, Matthias. Any thoughts on real estate investment trusts? Are they already at the bottom and good to add up or something to wait until the dust settles? Yeah, so, so Matthias, I also see that you're a new user in the Facebook group, right? So I don't know how long you're uh, listening to Dividend Talk, but it's a standard answer for us when people ask us, like, is it at the bottom? Where is this? Look, we don't know. We c And I don't mean this to be like 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 cocky or something like that in my response honestly honestly we don't know about this stuff we we, we don't we can't time the markets yeah we really really don't know so that makes it so hard for us to even answer this question um, generally if you look at the industry uh, here you can sometimes look at multiples of an industry and such and whether they are on the low end historically or on the high end historically for me, when I look at it, I don't see anything special in, in the REIT sector that makes me think like, oh, historically, they're really low. Yeah. If I look at the share price, I can just see that they bottom in October if I look at one of the, the REIT ETFs. But it doesn't say me anything. It really doesn't say me anything. So from that point of view, I would also like to say it's one of our quotes again, uh, which we borrowed probably from someone else. <laughs> it's not a stock market. It's a market of stocks. So if you're just interested in one of the REITs and you think that this REIT will be doing better from where it is today, uh, 10 years from now, you think it will grow, let's say with 50% over time, you see the market space for them and you feel that like, for instance, a multiple of 20 times FFO is therefore uh, still reasonable. You, you pr could probably buy this stock, right? Yeah. Um, you might not get a great price appreciation, but if the dividend is well, do it. If it's a 30 PE, uh, 30 FFO, I will probably not touch it. Yeah. If it's a 10, hmm, maybe better, yeah? But this also, again, is like, look at it from an individual stock point of view and, and do a little bit of research on the profitability and the future growth prospects. Yeah. And that will tell you whether the dividend has growth potential. But you also have to look at real estate investment source there it's a unique market it's quite complex american us european mm. com completely different and then even within the sector you have subsectors you have office space you have retail you have so many different sectors and i, I would argue office space is struggling right now because yeah. because people are working from home and, and we can see that but maybe if realty income we had defama we had yeah. Mateus on I mean, the dynamics are different and it's actually prime for that yeah we also know historically reads do quite well well real estate will do quite well in in high interest rates and stuff yeah. so you would imagine it is actually the time to buy them was probably last year and and maybe some of them are overvalued i'm not an expert in that but there's always value out there in the market there's a reason why there is there may be some struggling and and conditions will change um mm. for me i would i would echo what ev joy said find a good company at a relatively attractive price based on what you think and what you think of the market and, and stick and stick to that but i don't think you can go too far wrong with realty income honestly yeah no. <laughs> I, I think if i if i was going to pick one 
I, I would pick them. I'm also yeah. interested in VG properties. I've, I've mentioned casino play. Uh, casino play. I, lo- I think Vegas. I think that has huge potential. And yeah. um, there's a question on Blackstone later, but I know VG have bought the Vegas hotels off of mm. Blackstone, and they've. Re- I think they they own all that area there. Nice, so, nice, um, nice. I think that's that's a decent play as well. Imagine being a landlord of just Las Vegas. Yes. To say like, I own look this. at this motherfuckers. So all these <laughs> casinos are mine. Yeah, let's party. Like, like have a hangover. The movie. Yeah. I, then, then <laughs> Dionysus, you ask us get a bit tipsy before the show. We're, uh, we're doing it in the show. We, we are doing it in the <laughs> yeah. show. Then Bradley is asking, like, what is your highest yielding stock? Yeah, it's interestingly, it's it's Altria, um, 8.26%. So the cigarette uh, play, yeah. Altria. Yeah. But Altria is a bit of a risky stock for me, uh, I would say, to own, because they lost this battle with British American yeah. Tobacco about the IQOS uh, vaping device. They, they sold the license, or the rights to Philip Morris as well, to be able to sell it from 2024. They made this... They bought Jules, right? Yeah. So it's not. I guess it's not a buy recommendation, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it's Omega Healthcare. It's neither a buy recommendation. They are struggling with their operators. So, f- but they are already struggling for three years since COVID. So management is dealing with it excellent. Excellent dividend has not been growing over the last two three years. I have it as a high yield play, purely like that. And uh, it already, I have already like a fifty percent return on investment or something like that on the capital deployed. I would not recommend generally investing in such high yield stocks if you are afraid of capital loss. I would not do it. It's for me yeah. more like an exception in my portfolio. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why they're so high yield. You yes, mentioned, you exactly. mentioned all three. There's a reason why they're eight point six percent. I owned them before, <laughs> before, before they were, before they were that, and I keep. I was wheeling them in and out, so my cost base is actually quite quite low. I think it's around twenty eight dollars, mm-hmm. um, so it's not it's not too bad. But there's always a reason why you're getting six, seven, eight, nine percent. So just just be aware of that. And um, Tim has asked us our thoughts on Spirax Sarco ticker symbol SPX um, trading on the Lon- London Stock Exchange. On right? the London Stock Exchange, yeah. yeah. So how long would you wait for a company like this to drop to a better value? I know they were on the Noble 30, but honestly, I never looked into them before today. I mean, their financials look, look incredible, but then I started looking at their products and, and they, they use peristaltic pumps. We use them on quite a regular basis in my industry. And Watson Marlowe is actually the brand that we use. We've tried other brands and they've been awful. Watson Marlowe is what we keep coming back to, it's quality. And if that's a symbol of the rest of our products, then I would say, quality is what this company has but again looking looking at complete opposite to what we're looking at with vfc you can see i have kaifeng open here but you can see their revenue growing their cash flow i love to see it trending up the way um free free cash flow per share dividend per share and their debt level did increase back in 2017 presumably they bought something to to bought plus some, some company to build up that brand i don't know but on the face of it Looking at the financials, it's definitely worth a deeper dive. Their yield is a little bit low, um, but and their forward PE is a little bit high. So I would agree, yes, they would need to drop in price before I get interested in them. But if I was to go from experience and quality, which is what I've done with Schneider recently, I would put these guys up there. Because, I mean, I think that's important uh, for any company that you're working in. We, we go back to them. We've, we've tried cheaper alternatives. If it's never worked. Quality, customer service, they've, they've been top notch. Super, super. Glad that they are a Noble 30 member. Yes, and, and now they're going on my whiteboard upstairs because I think... After it needs to be there. It needs yeah. to be there, yeah. I need to wait for them to drop in price. Hey, then Mark Rosie from Facebook is asking, he just came across Alexandria Real Estate Equity, sticker symbol A-R-E, that might be worth checking out. They focus on creating collaborative spaces for life sciences and technology. They seem to really focus on one field. Similarly, to Digital Realty Trust, DLR. <laughs> Their top tenants include Bristol Myers, Moderna, Sanofi, Novartis. What mm. do you think about that? Do you know anything about them? I, I don't really, but it's it's definitely a good concept to me. And what, I, what I'm interested in is, is Sanofi actually is an Irish phrase, a stone throw away from my house. So we might actually yeah. take a walk tomorrow, but it's it's around the corner. I'm wondering, do they own that building? But I, yeah. think, that's, I think that's quite smart. We know these tenants, they're not going anywhere anytime soon, yeah. are they? 
Yeah, true, true, true. But I, I think as it on the face of it, it maybe looks like a business model, but I'd have to look a little bit deeper to to give a proper opinion on it. Um, and yeah. DLR, you've spoke about before. You're you're a fan, but again, no, I'm not a fan. Oh, you're not I'm a fan. not a fan, and no, I, I, initially they were on my watch list because I love the cloud business and that yeah. they are providing all the data centers. But what I'm seeing is limited FE funds from operations growth. And what I'm also seeing there with is actually that they don't have pricing power. I mean, the pricing power seems to be with Facebook, Google, Amazon and yeah. such. So they're just squeezing digital realty trust out. That's the feeling I get when looking at their numbers. So this could yeah. be the same then if, if you think about it. it it's a similar, a similar situation. You have some big names, big companies they are and they could probably squeeze them and saying, well, we'll move on. We've yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So that's what I see with Digital Realty Trust. I've got just like four shares or six shares in this company. I will not, therefore, I will not invest further. Of course, if Digital Realty Trust goes to a 20% margin of safety, yeah, that's a different conversation. But generally, I don't see it as a high quality business. And yeah, that's a question then also about this one. Yeah. Hey, but then Miboš Markovic is asking, us, what is your take on Blackstone at these prices? Yeah, I, I think I, I spoke about them two or three weeks ago and they were at $75. I was hoping they were going to drop to 50 Honestly, I would load up the truck if they were at 50 I still like this company under $100. They were in the news negatively, I know, around our mortgages and, and in their private business. They've sold, as we, I mentioned with Vici, they've sold off the real estate. So they're starting to sell off that real estate portfolio now at elevated levels. And they're starting to deploy that capital elsewhere. So I think under 100, they are worth dipping into. I would just prefer to see them probably closer to $50 at the moment. Yeah. But I, I think I think it's a, a great alternative to BlackRock, cheaper, as I said. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm buying them in drips and drabs. Nice. And then Wukash Wobach is asking, what's your long-term view on the semiconductor space? For instance, is there any key stock that you think about? And, and, and do you have any particular opinion about Bezi and we from the Netherlands? Yeah, so semiconductor space is depressed at the moment. Was it two years ago? It was, it was, mm. it was the in thing. But look at Moore's Law. Semiconductors are not going anywhere. We're going to need them. They're more and more prevalent yeah. all the time. Personally, Risks and rewards, I think it's a good time to start buying them. They're a little bit depressed, I think, as as China. I think China's key here, isn't it? As yeah. that starts opening up, everything will start coming back into balance a little bit. I do like Taiwan Semiconductors. I like Intel. I think I think Intel are probably the... It's the, a value play. Yeah, I think, I think, play. I think it's, it's the one for me. You might be more aggressive and go with someone like NVIDIA. Yeah. Um, but I think... I think it's a great sector to get involved in. It's not in vogue anymore. It's It's... There's a little bit more value there. Yeah, I think it's. But a, if a you good think about secular growth trends like artificial intelligence yes. and such, right? Electric We're cars. just we're just at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So the digitalization of everything and high high needs for computing power, high computing power, it's 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 will only be more. So and yes, never ever something grows in a straight line. Yeah, in the of stock course, market, of so. course. And I think, I think we mentioned we were talking about quotes earlier, Warren Buffett quotes, and we said, buy when there's blood on the streets. And sometimes you don't know what that means. Is it a value trap? Is it not yeah. a value trap? But if you look at semiconductors, it can't be a value trap because we need these components. Exactly. We need these components. So yeah. I think buy when there's blood on the streets applies to someone like Intel, someone like Taiwan yeah. Semiconductors, to this type of industry at yeah. the moment. Yeah, also, point. greetings from, from Wicklow, Wicklow's two hours drive. If you want to come down to Watford, Come on down. <laughs> nice one, nice one. Um, I also didn't give a view on Bessie yeah. NV, maybe, you know. Well, Bessie NV, I mean, it, it is really a strong company. I will keep it really short, uh, Wukash. I am personally not invite, uh, investing in it because I'm not clear about management's commitment to the dividend. And so far in the past, they had a choppy dividend growth. They cut also in the past. So that's why I'm staying away from that one. But I know that the Kleine Capitalist and some others, also from the Netherlands, the dividend investors, they're really, really uh, impressed by this talk. But personally, for me, when I see the dividend track record and I don't see a clear commitment, 
it's too much for me to uh, uh, to really go further into the stock. It already doesn't pass my screening criteria. Yeah. And um, Gordon has said, enjoy our time together, have a pint. What is your take on ticker symbol UVV? Yes, yeah, so this universal corporation, right, uh, for all the listeners, it's effectively, look, we did just a quick analysis, right? Yes. But it seems to be a company that is producing tobacco, yeah? Yeah. Uh, you know, harvesting the tobacco plants. And then their customers are actually, from what I understand, disclosure here, I'm not 100% sure if this is correct, to Altria, Philip Morris, and British American Tobacco. So when you think about that, it's actually quite a nice bet looking at, uh, you know, okay, if you don't trust Philip Morris or Altria, who will win the game? Yeah. And you still believe that, you know, tobacco plants and, and not so not vaping, but just real tobacco is there to stay still enough, that there's still enough puff, puff in this one? I think it's actually, you know, a jack of all trades. So you can, you can just... Buy that one instead of one of the the end and and uh, the I said tobacco stocks at the end of the supply chain. Yeah, like you, you mentioned all three uh, earlier, ticker symbol MO, having a pretty rough time at the moment, losing a lot of business, a, a lot of companies, and then you have someone that's there providing them and providing the yeah. competitors. On the face of it, it does look like a decent idea, right? But then I look at all three is. So I look at my screener, I have this dividend talk screener that I use on, on Kaifin, okay? And I look at revenue and it's growing. I look at free cash flow, you can see that it's it's definitely not dropping, it's growing and then stayed steady and their dividend per share is, is growing. So it yeah. looks relatively okay. I wouldn't say it's perfect, but yeah. I mean, you wouldn't say that that looks too bad. And then you look at Universal Corporation and then you see, okay, revenue, choppy. Yeah. Free cash flow, negative, choppy. Yeah. Dividends, yeah, it was growing slowly and then a huge spike and debt also growing. So I think from a financial perspective, it looks worse than all three, even yeah. though from a business model, without knowing anything yeah. else around it, I think it sounds great. So yeah. for me, I'd have to look into it a little bit more, but based on my screener, I probably won't even pass that. Yeah. So Gordon, ignore what I said. But, but, but I would agree because it, it sounds good. The, the, the yeah. business model sounds good, but maybe they just can't translate yeah, exactly. that into into making money and here's a second question there like do you feel ever tired of the responsibility of continuously picking the right stock and finding the right pl- price for instance what about what we just heard from simon today just picking etfs uh, i mean it's 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 so funny how we get questions and stuff and they all interlink without even yeah. meaning it and i literally said those words i do feel jealous of being able to do that but do i ever feel tired of responsibility I don't think of it as a responsibility. As we said, it's a passion and we enjoy doing yeah. this. We might get a couple wrong, we'll get a couple right. But yeah. I think long term, this is a strategy that, that works. You buy yeah. growing, uh, you buy businesses at decent value with growing dividends. And I think it's proven to work. And we can yeah. see that in, we've got lots of stories like, I, I can't mention names. We, we both speak to this person who travels around Europe and in the US and is living off income. Um, I just think it's it's inspiring that people have done it. It's working. We know it works. So, yeah, I don't I don't I don't see a responsibility there. And this is, by the way, shout out to Chuck, Chuck from Facebook Group. Chuck, yes. We forgot to say that in the beginning, but Chuck, congratulations! You're one of the first Facebook members that mentioned explicitly, like one January 2023. You became financially independent. Yeah. I mean, congratulations, my friend. This is really, really, really awesome. And uh, thank you for sharing that. You're really a big inspiration to us. Also, thank you always for the engagement on Facebook and such. But wow, congratulations. This is what a milestone. Yeah, I mean, we both we both read that today. I was like, that's absolutely awesome. And we get inspiration off the community. And I think seeing someone retire, what I thought was funny was... He was self-employed. He terminated himself. <laughs> yeah, he terminated, <laughs> he terminated himself. himself. Yeah. So, but so. I mean, huge congratulations. That's that's what we're striving to. So, congratulations. Um, next, last question actually of the day is from Senor Developer. He loves Texas Instruments ticker symbol T X N, but their net income margin has gone from twenty five percent in twenty seventeen to forty four percent current. It looks like a cyclical company at the very peak. And as such, margins could come back down. What's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, he's right. It could come down. Um, 
that's the risk of investing um, I said that and that would have an impact on free cash flow yes that's uh, very important to mention um, I think that the company is currently valued if you consider the current margins if you think that the margins will go down there might be better prices in the future um, there was a time the Texas Instruments before let's say four or five years ago was trading at three or four percent yield let's say four percent yield so you know um, yeah I, I think he's spot on I'm, I'm happy with where it's trading at around when it's trading around 160 then I'm like kind of you know averaging uh, averaging in into it but uh, yeah he makes a good point if, if the margins go down it will hit cash flow and you can expect prices lower unless the market is again irrational and feels like it's just a, um, a one-off but we know that usually such trends are not a one-off it, it just reminded me that I need to add income margin to my screen. Or I do have gross margin, which is actually growing for Texas Instruments. Mm-hmm. So it, yeah, quite strange. But I think yes, you're you're right. It does seem like it could be a company that uh, that's at its very peak. But I mean, look at their history. Yeah. They they've they've come through this before as well, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. I feel pretty confident, and even if it means that their margin would go down, it will take them probably three four years. To catch up then again well you know i have time on my side yeah exactly and um, with that 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 concludes the end of the show probably just as well if we drank any more <laughs> we won't be able to finish it but again thanks thanks for our listeners thanks to the questions and i have to say i actually enjoyed this sitting face to face for the first time recording it was so much easier i think yeah definitely, um, definitely easier to, to vibe off each other but i mean Thank you. Thank you for coming all this way, actually. <laughs> You've come a long well, way. Thank so. you for the community because they've been buying me a shitload of coffees yes. so that they could... I, I, they actually paid my plane ticket here. So thank you for everyone that sponsored us. You made it a reality that we're now together. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And see you on the next episode, guys. See you on the outside. Remember, both of us at Dividend Talk are not certified financial specialists through formal education. We are just two guys sharing our journey for inspiration and entertainment purposes. Hence, this is not investment advice. Although we do our best, we can't promise that the information discussed is always correct, nor appropriate for you or anybody else. We always recommend that you do your own due diligence and be accountable for your own choices. As we always say, you can't borrow conviction from others. Last but not least, by listening to our podcast, you agree to hold us harmless from any ramifications, financial or otherwise, that occur to you as a result of acting on information provided in this podcast. 